Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I'm Adam Posen, the Institute's president, and we have a very fortunate speaker today for a special virtual event, Ms. Tokiko Shimizu, Assistant Governor of the Bank of Japan. Uh, she will be speaking today on Japan's economy and labor market. The labor market in Japan is extremely important, obviously not just for Japan, but for issues of monetary transmission, inflation, and global implications for how things pan out. It's of common interest to everyone, but it is little understood. Many Americans walk around with very strong preconceived notions about American labor markets, about European labor markets, and very little knowledge of the Japanese ones. And we're grateful to have the assistant governor with us today to speak on this topic. Uh, it is also important to think about the Japanese labor market in the context of the major reforms that were undertaken in previous years, including the womenomics, which massively increased female labor force participation in Japan, now significantly higher than in the US. Uh, Tokiko Shimizu, our speaker, is the assistant governor of the Bank of Japan. She is with the new governor, Kazuo Ueda, uh, at all the IMFC, IMF, G7, G20 meetings this week. Uh, as of her, she has been in that role since 2020, and she was previously the first woman executive director of the Bank of Japan. Uh, she's one of six executive directors for the bank. Her term will continue through at least next year. Um, she's been overseeing operations and economic analysis of the international department and, and oversees the bank's international affairs. Before being named executive director, Ms. Shimizu was the bank's general manager for Europe and its chief representative in London. She's been with the bank since 1987, having graduated from the University of Tokyo with a degree in urban engineering. It is my pleasure to invite to our stage at Peterson Assistant Governor Tokiko Shimizu. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Adam, to the, such a warm introduction. And it is a very great pleasure for me to have this opportunity to speak with you and at this great institute in the world. So since the last year, the Japanese economy has been affected by factors such as the high commodity prices. So high commodity prices have been translated into an increase in import prices that have raised Japan's CPI, as you can see the figure one. So today I would like to focus on the how, how the CPI inflation in Japan developing these days and what the difference uh, between Japan and other country, advanced countries. So you can see in the figure, the recent rise in inflation is mainly driven by energy, food, and durable goods. All of these items are highly dependent on import, imported goods in Japan. So for a long time, it has been difficult for Japanese farms to pass on these cost increases to their selling prices. So the one likely reason for them that this is that they have been very reluctant to pass on higher costs to maintain their price competitiveness. So in Japan, the market is so competitive, so they need to keep the price unchanged. So in the current phase, however, since the scale of rising in input prices has been so large and also it has affected the wide range of items. So many farms then have passed on, on cost increases. So however, Japan's CPI inflation decelerated from 42% to 3.1% recently so this mainly reflects the government's measures to reduce the household burden of higher energy costs. So as the effects of government's energy subsidies are expected to continue for some time, along with a waning of path of the rise in input prices, 
So it is projected that the CPI inflation rate will decelerate toward the middle of fiscal 2023. In contrast, you can see the figure one. The United States has experienced much higher inflation. Despite the recent decline in energy prices, inflational pressure has been still strong, driven by service prices. As a result, FOMC members and market participants anticipate that the U.S. inflation will remain well above the Fed's 2% target for this year. So such a divergence of the inflation between Japan and the United States partly illustrates a difference in labor market dynamics. This is the main theme of today's my remarks. The ongoing tightness in the U.S. labor market leads to robust wage growth that helps sustain the underlying inflationary trend. So this simultaneous increases in both wages and prices has been observed not only in the United States, but also in many other economies, in, in, such as Europe. For the last decades, so Japan's economy has improved significantly and labor market conditions have tightened, as illustrated in figure two. However, prolonged deflation reinforced people's mindset and behavior based on the assumption that prices would not increase easily. This is, we sometimes call the deflationary mindset. So these perceptions resulted in cautious wage setting behavior in the corporate sector, while an increase in labor supply of women and seniors supported economic growth in Japan that has undergone a decline in the total population. But such a participation resulted in a moderate growth in wages as well. So meanwhile, the last latest spring labor, the labor management wage negotiations, we call it Shunto, draw significant attention not only in Japan, but those global observers. So many large corporates have accepted a full amount of wage hikes requested by their labor unions. So as wage growth has become more important to retain talents in the rising inflation environments. So these developments are indicated in figure three. However, it should be noted that while corporate profits, the source of wage increases, have been at high levels on the whole, they vary across farms depending on size and industry. So it is also true that many members of small and medium-sized farms say that although they, their farm's performance has not well better import, import, improved, so they need to, or they have to raise wages as a defensive step. In order to wage increase to spread in a sustainable manner, it is necessary for these to become full-fledged and there need to be initiatives to, toward spreading the possible impact of increased profits overall, particularly to small and medium-sized farms. So wide spread wage hikes will put upward pressures on costs by increasing farms' personal expenses, while at the same time, demand will increase through improvement in household income, and this is likely to lead to moderate inflation. Let me turn to economic developments in Japan. So Japan's economy has picked up as a resumption of economic activity has progressed while public health has been protected from COVID-19. The driving force behind the pickup in the economy has been the recovery in services demand, which is associated with the resumption of economic activity and the cycle in the corporate sector from profits to investment. Although Japan's economy has picked up the pace of recovery itself 
in aggregate demand in Japan has been much weaker than in the United States, the figure for shows. COVID-19 has undermined Japan's economic activities longer than the United States. High commodity prices have put both downward pressures on household, real income, and upward pressure on corporate input cost. So as Japan heavily relies on energy imports. Meanwhile, the United States economy recovered very, very rapidly, exceeding its pre pandemic GDP level only one year after the COVID-19 outbreak. Strong demand, which has been su suppressed by the pandemic, has risen significantly during the course of economic recovery. Government economic measures have also contributed to the expansion of private consumption. So these developments show a stark con contrast to Japan that has experienced a very slow recovery. That said, there have been significant uncertainties over the outlook for economic activity. Particular attention is warranted on developments in overseas economic activity and prices as well as the financial markets. These are the main themes we discussed during this week. So with central banks in the United States, and Europe raising policy interest rates rapidly to contain inflation, there is a risk that global financial conditions will tighter further through adjustments in asset prices and that this will eventually lead to overseas economies deviating downward from the baseline scenario. More recently, financial market stress is drawing attention after the recent financial sector developments. Taking these risks into account, it is necessary to pay due attention to developments in the financial sector and their impact on Japan's economic activity and prices. So finally, let me talk about the bank's conduct of monetary policy. So there have been extremely high uncertainties for Japan's economy, including developments in overseas economic activity and prices and financial market stress. The CPI inflation rate currently exceeds 2%, but it is expected to decelerate below 2% from fiscal 2023 in terms of fiscal year average. So given these developments in economic activity and prices, the Bank of Japan deems it necessary to conduct monetary easing and thereby firmly support the economy and provide a favorable environment for firms to raise wages. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Governor Shimizu. Um, there would be applause, and I'm sure our virtual audience globally <laughs> is doing so. If we could, I think we'd like to do a bit more of a deep dive on the wage developments in Japan and the labor markets. Um, you mentioned in your remarks that part of the upward pressure on wages was absorbed by a increase in labor supply from seniors yep. and women, uh, despite the long-term demographic trend. Uh, meanwhile, in a lot of places in the US uh, at times, we've seen what looks like a bit of a labor shortage, at least yeah. mismatch and, and, and local shortages. Um, we've seen in the US a decline, partially recouped, but a decline in labor force participation of older workers. Um, so first, is there room for further participation growth, supply growth in Japan, either from women, older people? Um, and in a cyclical sense, I mean, is the downward pressure on wages over? A, a final point is just, as you're probably aware, uh, Charles Goodhart, the noted LSE professor, former Bank of England official, co-authored a book where he holds up Japan and he talks about the future need for the, the likelihood of rising wages across the advanced economies. And I 
we host an event for Charles similar to this, and, and I said, but Japan's experience is the opposite. <laughs> so anyway, if you could say a bit about both the long and short-term developments of labor supply in Japan, that would be great. Thank you, Adam, and that's a very great question. So demand and supply conditions in Japan's labor market have changed over time. So affecting wage and information, inflation dynamics. So let me share with you a few points that would be useful to assess the potential changes in the labor market structure. So before the pandemic in Japan, labor market conditions were so tight, so reflecting an increase in labor demand that was driven by an economic recovery. It's, uh, no, it's from the almost a decade we experienced the economic recovery. So however, uh, we saw an increase in labor supply as well. So figure five shows that. So figure five illustrates, so labor force participants, so you can see the seniors, a blue shaded bar, and the women, a white bar, were growing, so despite a persistent decline in the total population that is shown in the blue line. So the total number of employees has grown by more than 4 million since 2013. The governor Krola always saying that mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the 4 million is the magic number for him. So the sustained increase in labor force uh, supported the economic expansion, but at the same time leading to the moderate uh, wage growth. So, so will this trend continue? Mike's question is, no. I would say, so let me first explain seniors. The left panel of figure five, figure six, shows that labor force participation rate of seniors that had continued on an uptrend, but that it has remained more or less flat recently. So reflecting their concerns over the pandemic that temporarily discouraged them to work, probably similar situation of happening in the United States as well. So as you can see, the labor force participation rate for seniors aged 75 and over, a light blue line, has been significantly lower than those aged between 65 and 74, a blue line. That includes the baby boomers generation. The baby boomer has supported the increase in labor supply in the 2010s. But most of them are likely to retire in 2020s. It might include the governor, ex-governor Kuras <laughs> himself. So after reaching mid 70s as shown in the middle panel. So considering these factors, the pace of increase in labor force participation of seniors is projected to decelerate. Then let me turn to women labor participation. That's illustrated in the right panel. So traditionally, the chart for women's labor participation rate in Japan is called an M-shaped curve. So that indicates a low labor force participation rate in their childbearing and child rearing phases, uh, like uh, 35 year old and 44 year old. So a blue dotted line corresponds to the M-shaped curve as of 2010 in Japan. So the, but the, the curve started to move up, upward and flatten in recent years. So while the change was mainly driven by an increase in part-time jobs, not by full-time jobs that could accompany with restrictions in the workplace such as over time. So Japan's women labor force participation has been comparable to those in the United States and Europe these days. So these observ observations seems to suggest that room for additional labor supply have shrunk for women as well. So given these factors, it is highly likely that labor market conditions will tighten further as long as economic recovery continues. So labor demand is expected to rise due to an economic recovery and labor supply is unlikely to increase to the extent that it did in the 2010s. That said, uncertainties regarding the outlook are high. 
So labor demand could be affected by the pace of economic growth. As I mentioned earlier, there have been significant uncertainties over the outlook for economic activity that includes overseas economy and financial stability. So the IMF uh, seems to have very strong concern about that. <laughs> On the labor supply side, the upside risk of labor force participation rate for women might be limited. However, the total hours worked per female employee have remained low compared with those per male employee. So in light of the progress in labor market reform and government measures to facilitate women's labor participation, there still seems to be room for labor supply of women to increase in the form of rising the number of working hours. So it is necessary to pay close attention to developments in labor supply. Let me stop here. Thank you. Um, just one quick follow-up question on labor supply. I, I realize this is a sensitive issue for some people in Japan, but what is the role of migrant workers from abroad or temporary workers from abroad? What is the, is there potential growth for that? Or is that so small it's not relevant for the BOJ? Yeah, actually the number of the uh, foreign labor forces uh, steadily increase in Japan. Mm -hmm. But probably we need to have further reform of mm -hmm. the legal system to accept the larger number of immigrants. And of course, the, we admit that we, it is necessary to have enough number of labor forces from abroad right. to support the Japanese growth in the future. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So now linking the labor force developments, the supply developments you were talking about, back to monetary policy, um, wage setting is obviously key. Um, you mentioned Shunto, the annual bargaining round. Um, the image many of us have, to the degree we have an image, is that's for the big Japanese companies with the so-called lifetime employment. What about the people who are not in those kinds of jobs? What about the people in small and medium enterprises? And, and, and more importantly, just on the aggregate, um, how much do you see large corporations actually giving their workers raises? You, the chart you had, I can't remember if it was slide three or two or whatever, but it showed essentially no real wage growth <laughs> for several years. So, so is this changing? Yeah, so the, I agree that the major labor uh, forces uh, are the employed by the large corporations and white collars, their wage increase is very rare. So they rather uh, prefer the stable job opportunities than uh, to the wage increases for a long time. So, but I, I'd like to uh, focus on the dual structure in the labor market. So it includes uh, not only full-time or regular white-collar employees, uh, but also the non-regular part-time employees, as I mentioned in the women's uh, labor forces uh, styles, labor, uh, working styles. So the, this, this is not necessarily a good story, but the majority of the uh, young and women uh, work style is the part-time these days. So there is a clear difference in wage formations uh, between these two types of workers, as indicated in the panel of figure seven. So wages of part-time workers, like blue line, uh, grew much faster than those of full-time employees, dark blue line. In the second half of the 2010s, when labor market conditions tightened, so what resulted in such a wage gap? First, the job mobility played an important role. So non-regular workers tend to actively move across positions and sectors compared to the regular workers. So tight labor market conditions were more likely to lead to job hopping in part-time workers that required employers to raise wages for their retention. So another factor is a strong preference to job security over wages in the regular employees. 
So following the experiences of severe employment adjustments in the past, so this priority has long been shared among labor unions and management, resulting in the well restrained wage growth of regular workers. So these two characteristics of the dual structure has led to the difference in wage growth between regular and non-regular workers. So let me turn to outlook of for wage of non-regular workers first. With the resumption of economic activity becoming full-fledged, part-time workers in the face-to-face -face services industries have been clear rise in wages recently. As I mentioned earlier, tighter labor market conditions driven by the increase in labor demand and limited room for additional labor supply might accelerate their wage growth, especially in those sectors. And let me move on to regular employees. So such upward pressure on wages of part-time workers has gradually spilled over to some full-time workers, especially in sectors with relatively high job mobility that include face-to-face -face services, small and medium-sized firms, and younger employees. The right panel of figure seven shows wage growth by industry. So in this figure, industries are grouped in accordance with the sensitivity of wages to labor market conditions. As you can see, the large wage growth has been observed recently in industries with high sensitivity to labor market conditions, lightly shaded bar in the chart. So that include face-to-face -face services. The left panel of figure eight explores sensitivity of wages to labor shortage by farm size. While labor market conditions have had no statistically significant impact on wages for large firms, a tightening of labor market conditions has tended to push up wages for small and medium sized firms. So, and also from a generation perspective, even at large firms, wages of younger employees have been albeit slightly, as illustrated, have been have risen, so albeit slightly, as illustrated in the right panel of figure eight. A labor shortage in the younger generation, along with their high job mobility, is considered to contribute to a rise in their wage levels. So despite these good signs of wage growth, a broader rise in wages is needed to achieve the price stability target of 2% in a sustainable and stable manner. As I mentioned earlier, the Bank of Japan deems it necessary to conduct monetary easing and thereby firmly support the economy and provide a favorable environment for the firms to raise wages. So I'll stop here. Thank no, thank you. Um, two, we're almost out of time for you to go back to the official meetings. Two quick follow-ups, if I could. Um, first, is it sounds like the in the dual labor market, the number of irregular workers in the sense of part-time workers, young workers, non-large company workers, female workers, seems to be getting larger and larger. Um, will it? Is this the trend? Is at some point the overall Japanese labor market going to look more competitive like the, that part of the, the labor market? Yes, it is very historically or structural changes, I feel. So uh, I myself uh, work in a large traditional company, <laughs> and I feel that the younger people require uh, further increase of their wages, and rather than the, uh, expecting 20 or 30 years uh, working at the same company. Yeah. So this kind of changes or working motivations might affect the overall picture of the Japanese labor structure. And I strongly hope that these younger generation, as well as the female workers participation, will change the long-term, very steady uh, labor markets in Japan. Thank you. A final question. Um, you spoke about the interaction between profitability and wages and demand. 
obviously another factor for Japan, going back to your first charts, is um, imported inflation yeah. from energy, but also the yen's weakening against the dollar. How do you see pass through from these external developments into domestic inflation and to wage inflation in Japan? Yeah, yeah. So this, uh, this is a very, very uh, unique phenomena uh, during this uh, recent two years or three years. So before that, uh, the Japanese companies are very reluctant to pass on those import cost increase to the, their selling prices. But these days, we observe a strong uh, path to uh, behaviors, uh, even in Japanese large firms as well as major SMEs, based on our Tantan survey. So the, I, we strongly uh, hope that this kind of path to behavior will continue for a while. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, people viewing from around the world, thank you for joining us for today's lecture and discussion by Tokiko Shimizu, the Assistant Governor of the Bank of Japan on Japan's economy and labor market. We look forward to welcoming many of you back this afternoon for a speech and discussion with Governor Joachim Nagel, uh, the president of the, excuse me, not governor, the president of the Deutsche Bundesbank as a continuation of our macro week as we had this morning and then tomorrow a online and live discussion with Yi Gong, the governor of the People's Bank of China. But in this case, let me both personally and on behalf of the Institute, thank you, Tokiko. Thank you. Bill. And pass our best wishes to you and the new leadership team at the BOJ. Yep. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. I enjoyed much. Very, Very much. much. Thank, thank you. you.